This is Bridges. I'm Larry Josephson. Today, the first in a series, What is a Jew? My guest is Rabbi Istmar Shorsh, Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary here in New York. Judaism is an effort to embrace the supremacy of the individual and uh, the eternal value of community. Many Jewish leaders fear that the high rate of intermarriage will lead to the disappearance of Jews as a distinct American group. Rabbi Shorsh argues that it is individualism and a lack of anti-Semitism that have loosened the bonds that hold the Jewish community together. There's no anti-Semitism left in American society. This is an unprecedented experience in Jewish history. What is a Jew next on Bridges? This is an all-new edition of Bridges. This is Bridges. My name is Larry Josephson, and my guest today is a, an old friend of Bridges, Chancellor Ismar Shorsh, who is the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary in America and in New York City. And uh, we last heard from Rabbi Shorsh in a debate about physician-assisted suicide with Dr. Samuel Klagsbrunn. Rabbi Shorsh, welcome back to Bridges. Larry, I'm pleased to be back. Thank you. And the reason I'm doing this is that I put a toe back into the pond, or at least so far a mental toe, into getting back into Jewish life. My grandfather came out of the same tradition you do, of conservative Judaism. He was a founder of Temple Sinai in Los Angeles around the turn of the century. And he was a man of the world. He was a successful businessman, and he enjoyed culture, and he was certainly no one who sat and prayed all day, but he took his religion seriously, and at Seder's and at uh, Yom Kippur and other times, he uh, believed and he practiced. His children, he had three daughters, my mother obviously was one of them, rejected the practice and the liturgy of Judaism. They did not reject the culture. They were proud to be Jews. They did not change their name. They did not pass for Gentile or anything like that, but uh, there was a very definite anti, I'm trying to think of the right word, it isn't anti-clerical, they weren't angry at rabbis, but I think it was that they wanted to be Americans, and they thought of the rigorous practice of the Jewish religion as something of the old country, as having something to do with the shtetl, and my father and my uncle basically had no use for it. Yet uh, they loved the jokes and the locks and bagels, and the, the, they were proud of being Jews, and they knew who all the Jewish ball players were, and the Jewish, the real names of Paul Muni and Al Jolson and Jack Benny and so forth. And then I rebelled on another level because uh, I was fed a lot of myths and chivalrous about Gentiles, about how Gentiles were not as loving towards their children as Jews, or they weren't as uh, clean, or I don't know, a lot of really dark stuff. And so what did I do as a young man? I went out and <laughs> made as many Gentile friends as I could, uh, eventually married to and had relationships with others. And my mother, incidentally, who died about a year and a half ago, left explicit instructions that she did not want any religious service, did not want any rabbi, particularly one who didn't know her, to preside over her memorial. And my aunt, her, my mother's younger sister, asked me if I wanted to come and say the Kaddish for my mother. And I said, yeah, sure. And I did. And it was a very uh, good thing to do. So what I've concluded after 59 years on this planet, that I can't live without some kind of faith, that materialism or logical positivism or all the other sort of religions that are out here in America aren't enough, and that I can't live without a community either. Whether it's the Jewish community or some other community, I don't know what it is yet, but so I'm sort of making an exploration on my own part on this question, and yet I note that other Jews are still running away from it. Uh, the, the, the figure that everybody talks about is that there's a 50% intermarriage rate. It actually runs, according to a survey, from 72% for secular Jews down to 3% for Orthodox. So. From your point of view, why do you think so many Jews are marrying out, or marrying Gentiles? Let me start with your uh, autobiography, Larry. Your personal saga is a good prism 
through which to refract a lot of the things going on in American society. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that your mother's story tells you something about the nature of Judaism. Judaism is both uh, a religion and a people. It's always had a national dimension as well as a spiritual dimension. And a cultural uh, one as well, right? I mean, you... Well, religions produce culture, uh, okay. uh, but Judaism did not take the uh, road of Christianity. Christianity uh, was able to divest itself of uh, identification with a single people or a single plot of land. It became truly international. Uh, Judaism never quite went that way. Judaism became an international religion because it invented the ceremony of religious conversion. Religious conversion was unknown in antiquity, and it was really the Jewish people who created the possibility of uh, joining the faith community of another nation. But Judaism never divested itself of land or people, and therefore always retained a very pronounced ethnic component. So what was left in the identity of your mother was the ethnic side. The religious side had evaporated or withered. Uh, and all that was left was uh, the sense of uh, national heritage. And that's what she transmitted to you in a diluted and negative way, uh, the ethnic prejudices of her upbringing. Your um, family story tells us something else about the Jewish condition in America. Uh, your ancestors wanted to make it in American society, but it wasn't a smooth path. There were a lot of uh, obstacles in the way because uh, at the turn of the century, American society was not without a uh, high degree of anti-Semitism. The uh, uh, immense Jewish immigration in the early decades of the 20th century led to the passage of an anti-immigration bill that uh, effectively closed the doors to Jews uh, in the interwar period precisely when they needed a country to go to after the rise of Hitler. Our situation is totally different today. There's no anti-Semitism left in American society. We don't have to prove ourselves in order to get in. We don't have to strip ourselves of anything in order to get in the doors are all open. That is a huge difference between uh, the generation of your children and the generation of your mother. This is an unprecedented experience in Jewish history. Jews have always lived in societies where there was uh, a measure of hostility toward them. And uh, that external pressure has made a contribution to the cohesiveness of uh, uh, the Jewish community. It wasn't so easy to get out. In the Middle Ages, one had to convert. One literally had to walk away from Judaism and embrace Christianity to get out. You don't have to do that in American society. The doors are all open, and so uh, the external pressure has been removed, and American society, in a way, is a laboratory. Is there sufficient internal power in Judaism to uh, keep the Jewish people together in a totally open society that knows no anti-Semitism. The only anti-Semitism around is that from some uh, minorities who resent Jewish success. And of course there's the fringe and militias and all those people, but you're right, in, in, in respectable circles there isn't any. Uh, uh, in, in circles that determine the welfare of American society. Uh, but uh, Larry, I want to make another comment about your uh, autobiography. There's a second factor uh, that is reflected in your story, and that is uh, the high degree of individualism that uh, is encapsulated in your family story. And that, too, is uh, a major dynamic in American society. This society has granted more individual freedom to uh, the American uh, citizen than any other country in the West or in history. That's a new phenomenon. It's a test for American society. I think it's a test for the Jewish people. So in a society where uh, the highest value is uh, individual freedom, can a religion that emphasizes 
allegiance to the past and uh, the value of community. Can such a religion work in a society where individualism is at a premium? So you have two very new factors at work in the context of Jewish life in America. One is the absence of anti-Semitism, and the other is the availability, uh, the celebration of individual uh, freedom. That is mirrored in the, another part of my family's history. I can remember as a young boy, seders with 50 or 60 people. My grandfather had roughly nine brothers and sisters. My grandmother had about the same. And they all had many children, so there was a huge family. And all of a sudden, as the 50s gave way to the 60s and the 60s gave way to the 70s, the family in Los Angeles sort of uh, uh, spread out by centrifugal force. And I have cousins in San Diego and, uh, you know, all 50 or 100 miles apart. And we very rarely get together. My mother's uh, shiva was the last time that I can remember that the whole family, people I hadn't seen in 30 years, came to it. And we are, I, I always thought it was my own family. We're a family of loners, individualists. You have to make very careful appointments to see people. You don't just drop in on them, which in my mother's time, they did. My, my mother and grandmother, after my father died and my grandfather died, they lived in the same apartment building. And if one didn't call after, you know, two hours, there was serious concern. So uh, that's happened to our family, and I guess that's part of the American scene. But the problem with it all, the problem with freedom, is that it doesn't give you much sustenance. It gives you the ability to, do, to be or to do whatever you want. But in those moments of crisis, it, it, a death or a, a moral crisis or an, you lose your job or somebody dies or uh, you have ethical dilemmas or you even wonder about the nature of existence and why you're here. Freedom uh, doesn't produce uh meaning automatically. It creates opportunity. Uh, it doesn't necessarily stress the importance of the inner life. In American society, we spend most of our freedom uh, pursuing the pleasures of the external uh, life. But uh, there is an internal life that exists and is one day going to confront us and ask us what it's all about. The freedom of American society has produced uh, uh, a lot of atoms, free floating atoms. And uh, aloneness doesn't produce uh, a sense of belonging, a sense of continuity. So we look for community. And I think that's what you are describing. You look at the search for meaning and the search for community. And in Judaism, uh, they're one and the same thing because meaning flows from community. And it is a community which isn't uh, formed yesterday, but it's a community that has uh, existed for more than 3,000 years. It's a community which is saturated with uh, historical memory and ancient ritual. But it's also a community that is uh, highly literary in nature. The culture of Judaism is a literary culture. The people of the book. We are the people of the book. In a couple of days we are going to commemorate the destruction of the temples. And the historical question is, why didn't Judaism come to an end with the destruction of the first temple in 586 BCE or with the destruction of the second temple by the Romans in 70 CE? And I think the answer to that is that uh, we were able to replace the cult the sacrificial system with a canon, a sacred book. So the foundation of the community was no longer a central sanctuary, but it became uh, a book that uh, commanded, that linked uh, the community to God. Uh, and this but, is the Torah. And this is the Torah. But a book uh, is an intimidating uh, religious vehicle, because you got to know how to read. And you got to know how to read a foreign language. And uh, you have to know how to read an archaic book. It doesn't speak in the idiom of the 20th century. And all of those uh, factors uh, make it difficult for uh, a lonely American Jew to find his or her way back. Uh, 
there is so much preparation that has to take place before you can begin to appreciate the culture. You can't go to a Beethoven symphony uh, without preparation. It's an acquired taste. Good wine is an acquired taste. Living as a Jew is an acquired faith and simply can't be appropriated from one day to the next. So the real question that you are raising is, how do you uh, uh, find your way back? I have to say that as much as I crave community, one of the reasons I rebelled as a young man is that community can also be oppressive. If the community says the outsiders, the goyim, are not as good as we are, if the community says Jews are this, that, and the other thing, and the other people aren't. I mean, I never knew growing up in suburban Los Angeles that there was a Jewish proletariat or Jewish prostitutes, or I found out in the 60s there were Jewish junkies and Jewish alcoholics, stuff that never got under the tent of the positive stereotype. So that part of my rebellion and my flight from Judaism, from the community, has been a feeling that somehow I'm part of a a rather narrow provincial culture that is not a part of this American life, is a part of this American world. I think we live uh, in an enlightened age where uh, uh, religions can no longer uh, sustain themselves by uh, hating the other, by denigrating the other, even by being in competition with other religions. Uh, we live in a world of multiple religions. Religious pluralism is a fact of American society. It is a cultural achievement, a political achievement that we celebrate. So the rhetoric of religion needs to become uh, thoroughly positive. Uh, what is it that uh, a religious community can offer uh, an individual? And it is not uh, dislikes, it's not prejudices, it's not a sense of superiority, it's just a sense of fulfillment. Uh, and I think that uh, religiously we have traveled far toward that road. There is much less negative rhetoric today than there was uh, when your parents came to this country or your grandparents. Uh, well, all but for the very orthodox, though. That's a special problem both in this country and particularly in Israel. And Israel is a whole other subject for me. I've never been there. I kind of want to go, but I'm also, because my grandparents were Zionists, I could never question and in the 60s there was nothing to question because Israel was under attack but now that Israel seems to be relatively safe uh, there are all kinds of questions that have come up about the nature of Israeli society and particularly the role of the rabbinate vis-a-vis -vis American values of pluralism and acceptance and that well I, I, I don't want to get off into Israel but since you raised it I will just put one other dynamic that I think we need to be cognizant of if we're going to appreciate the challenge to Judaism in the American open society. The third factor, I spoke about the absence of anti-Semitism, I spoke about uh, the celebration of individualism. I think the third factor at work on Jews in American society is a decline in allegiance to uh, the state of Israel. I think there is uh, a growing measure of estrangement between young American Jews and Israel. The reason this is uh, an important factor is that Israel has been such a cohesive force in American Jewish life uh, since the Second World War. Israel has been the major component of American Jewish identity and now all of a sudden we wake up in a world of individualism where there is no anti-Semitism and we discover that loyalty to Israel becomes uh, steadily diluted. So the challenge to continuity in American Judaism is an enormous one, the likes of which we have uh, uh, never confronted. But I, I want to get back to uh, the religious rhetoric. I do not think that uh, what we can offer our children is a superior religion. I do not think that we can offer our children a religion that claims to have the truth, and in fact all the truth. What we need to offer our children is a religion that has been around for a long time and managed to solve most of the problems of uh, creating a meaningful life here on earth. We need to persuade our children that uh, this is a religion that can work for them. It is their religion. It is uh, a heritage that uh, is worth perpetuating. We venerate old buildings. 
there is always a measure of reverence when we go to uh, an ancient ruin. Well, uh, an ancient religion is also worthy of uh, reverence and uh, study. So I think that uh, Judaism needs to be presented to our children as a very rich way of relating to uh, God, to eternity, to uh, the mystery of existence, to all those things that go beyond the everyday, which uh, are not susceptible to simple answers. It's not the only answer to uh, those mysteries, but it is a very effective answer, and it has worked for a long time. And the community that has been created in this effort to develop a relationship to uh, eternity and to God is a very powerful community when it works correctly. I have this little chart from a short article in a, in a Jewish magazine called Moment, and it came out of a survey in 1990 called the National Jewish Population Study, and it's a big matrix, and it shows that if you start out with 200 Jews, each 200 secular Jews, 200 reformed Jews, 200 conservative, 200 centrist orthodox, and 200 uh, yeshiva-oriented orthodox, in the first generation, that you'll wind up with radio is not very good at doing numbers, but I'll try this. If you start out with 200 secular Jews in the first generation, you'll have 73 in the second, 27 in the third, and 10 in the fourth generation. The intermarriage rate among secular Jews is 72 percent. And among Reformed Jews, uh, you start out with 200, you wind up with 27 in the fourth generation with a 53 percent intermarriage rate. Conservative, where you come from and I came from, 200 will beget 125 in the second generation, 77 in the third, 48 in the fourth, with a 37 percent intermarriage rate. Then, interestingly enough, when you get to the both branches of Orthodox Judaism, as defined in the survey, you start out with 200 of centrist Orthodox, you wind up in the fourth generation with 692, and if you start out with 200 among the, the, the yeshiva-oriented uh, Orthodox Jews, you start out with 200 in the first, you wind up with 5,175 in the fourth. And that leads into a question, a really easy question, what is a Jew? Because I assume that the survey uh, only dealt with matrilineal descent. And I have a, a child who is a Jewish by patrilineal descent. That raises probably the thorniest issue in this whole so-called continuity problem is who is a Jew? That's uh, a wonderful way to formulate uh, the question because that's uh, really at the heart of that prognostication. The uh, prognostication is so simple-minded because it doesn't take into consideration uh, what is Jewishness and the complexities of uh, Jewishness. This is a unilinear prognostication. Uh, everything goes one way and there are no zigzags and certainly no reversals. But uh, who is to say that someone who marries out in this generation, uh, his or her children aren't going to come back in the next generation? Jewishness is a very powerful psychological dynamic. There are lots of instances where Jews themselves return who have uh, moved away and where their children come back. So there are lots of uh, reversals which uh, make this prognostication so simple-minded. Um, the new Orthodox who are all over this neighborhood and... And look, I, who is... The Orthodox live in the same American society as we do. They struggle with individualism. They struggle with an absence of anti-Semitism. Uh, they also struggle with an estrangement uh, with Israel. They're grappling with the same problems and... Uh, they can predict with such assuredness that there's no attrition in the Orthodox community. And look at the poverty in the ultra-Orthodox community. In the state of Israel, where the average birth rate in the ultra-community is 10 children, the poorest city in the country is B'nai Barak, which is ultra-Orthodox. 60% of the males don't work. They, they the, spend their day in shul? They, 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 they spend their day studying. The ultra-Orthodox community in Israel is a huge artificial welfare population 
which is uh, sustained on the public dole. The poverty that these children are born into is uh, indescribable. With ultra-Orthodox families have difficulty producing dowries for their daughters because of that poverty. Begging in Israel among the ultra-Orthodox is a way of life. Does that fragile economic foundation uh, give any assurance of it, this community being able to sustain itself for the next 200 years? Hardly, hardly. Isn't there some kind of rough correlation between the more secular you are, the more wealthy? No, I think you have a growing phenomenon of wealth in the, uh, in the Orthodox world in the United States. Uh, but I do want to say one thing uh, constructively here, and that is what uh, the Orthodox contribution to the continuity dilemma is that they have shown that intensive Jewish education works. They have invested their money in schools rather than synagogues. They have built a very impressive educational system, and they keep their children in that system as long as possible. And uh, the results suggest that if you are going to uh, offset uh, the individualism and the absence of anti-Semitism in this country, you've got to invest in long-term intensive Jewish education. That's the formula for the future. You're listening to Bridges. I'm Larry Josephson. My guest is Rabbi Istmar Shorsh, Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary and a leader of the conservative wing of American Judaism. I have a friend, a woman, who was raised in a uh, very reformed, secular Jewish home who, for whatever reason, decided to uh, take up the practice of Judaism seriously from a conservative, not an orthodox point of view. She keeps the Sabbath. She eats kosher. She goes to shul on Saturdays and on holidays. Uh, and I went with her a couple of times, and I uh, found the, the experience to be very enjoyable. I don't know if that's the right word. Uh, but I got something out of it. But I also, because I was asleep in Hebrew school and rebelled against even having to go there, I didn't know much about what was going on on the bima, on the platform where the Torah and the Ark and the rabbi and the cantor are. And uh, like an opera, you, you brought up Beethoven. When you go to an opera and you know what's going on and what's in the libretto, and what the jokes are, and the new super titles and the Met titles help a lot, you get a whole lot more out of the opera. In the same way, if you know what the prayers are saying and you know what the holiday is about, you mentioned a holiday marking the destruction of the temples. I'm ashamed to tell you, I don't know what the name of that holiday is. It's Tishuav. It's the ninth uh, of Av. And it's a lugubrious period in uh, the Jewish calendar. The ninth of Av uh, is a 24 hour fast day and uh, commemorates the destruction of the two temples, but it has uh, grown over the centuries to become a day of uh, reflection about the fate of uh, the Jewish people. So many calamities are brought to mind during this 24-hour fast. I might just stay with that for a moment to make a point about the nature of Judaism. There are only two 24-hour fast days in the Jewish calendar. One is Yom Kippur in the fall, and the other is Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, in uh, the summer. To me, they uh, show the axes of uh, Jewish existence. Uh, Yom Kippur is a day when uh, the individual faces his or her mortality. We re reflect on the fate of the individual. Well, that's balanced with this other 24-hour day fast when we reflect on the fate of the community. So if you wish, uh, the religious dimension is Yom Kippur, the ethnic dimension is Tisha B'Av, or if, if you wish, the individual is Yom Kippur. And a religion that doesn't answer the needs of the individual is not going to stay around very long. But Tisha B'Av is uh, the centrality of community in Judaism. Judaism is an effort to embrace both uh, the uh, supremacy of the individual 
and uh, the eternal value of community. So those two fast days tell you a lot about the nature of Judaism. And I always thought Tisha B'Av was a minor holiday. No, when you see it uh, in the way that I've just presented it, it creates a symmetry. If you've got a religion which is only preoccupied with the individual, I think you've got an asymmetrical religion. You've got a religion that's essentially seeking to gratify the needs of the individual. We all want a good life. We all want to die without uh, illness. We all want to achieve salvation. But there's more to religion than just the satisfaction or gratification of the self. And that's why I think the role of community is so critical. And Tisha B'Av embodies the centrality of community. What about some of the other holidays that seem to be rooted in ancient agricultural practice? Uh, Sukkot, I think, is one of them. Uh, holidays that involve bringing in the harvest, uh, stuff that doesn't seem to have much much relevancy in the days of, of the Internet and cell phones and all these uh, high-speed uh, vehicles of life. That's only partially true. This is also the day of the environmental movement. This is an era when we are acutely aware of the damage that we're doing to the planet. And here you discover that there is uh, a very rich uh, agricultural dimension to the Jewish festivals. You are talking about the three pilgrimage festivals of Passover, Pentecost, and uh, Tabernacles, or Pesach, Shavuot, and Sukkot. In the biblical period, they were agricultural festivals, but they get quickly laid over with historical justification. So uh, Passover becomes the festival that celebrates the founding of the Jewish people, the Exodus uh, from Egypt, or uh, uh, in rabbinic literature, Shavuot uh, becomes uh, the festival that commemorates the giving of the Ten Commandments. Sukkot reminds us of uh, our ability to survive the ordeal of the wilderness. So there's a a layer of uh, agriculture and nature, there's a layer of history which transcends the natural world, and both are preserved. It's not that history retires nature, it's uh, that history adds another dimension to the celebration. And I would argue that uh, a religion with a long historical memory has uh, many dimensions, many layers, and that's what makes a festival beautiful because all of these resonances in a person who has struggled to understand the libretto, who has prepared himself before he goes to the opera, all those resonances make for a very rich spiritual experience. Uh, these are all vehicles for relating to the transcendent. You can't just say, I'm ready and waiting and God will appear. A religious experience is something you've got to work at. Are, are some of these holidays and celebrations and rituals metaphor, could be looked at as metaphorical for a, a modern secular American that, that you can construct modern meaning out of ancient practice? Sure, sure. Uh, let's take the most important uh, festival of uh, the Jewish calendar. It's the festival that uh, occurs every seventh day. It's called the Sabbath, Shabbat. Uh, Shabbat is a uh, uniquely modern day. Why? Because in this age of the uh, environmental crisis, what we need to achieve is a relationship to the world in which we live. Well, that's the function of uh, Shabbat, to relate us to the world. And Shabbat does it ritually, and the ritual is informed by a theology. What is the, uh, what's the theology? We're stewards. We're not landlords. And how do we express this? Every seventh day, we stop tinkering and tampering with the world in which we live. We acknowledge that the world has a creator. Uh, we acknowledge that uh, this world uh, has more meaning than just to gratify our social or bodily needs. Uh, and so for one day out of seven, we desist from all work. That's an eloquent ritual for expressing a notion of stewardship, a sense of responsibility that uh, we've got to pass this world on and work in good working order to the next generation. We can't consume all the raw materials because we're not the last. And people who came before us didn't do it, and we have a responsibility to the generations that follow us. 
I would add uh, that we can't also consume ourselves because this is an age of workaholism. Some weeks I work seven days and uh, because I think it's because I need to do so to survive as a marginal artist. In fact, it's probably because I need it psychically or I'm trying to push off other stuff I don't want to deal with. But it seems to me that the value of the Sabbath is also a time to repair oneself. Absolutely. Physically Absolutely. and morally and mentally that and intellectually. A, that's the right word to repair. Uh, what do we do on, uh, on the Sabbath? We repair our relationship uh, with our friends and family because Shabbat is supposed to be celebrated in a community. Uh, the Friday night meal is uh, a beautiful ritual that brings one together with one's uh, loved ones, with one's uh, nearest uh, and dearest. So we repair our relationship to other people. If we're workaholics, we don't have time for that every day of the week. But here is an enforced cessation of work so we can draw close once again. Uh, we draw close to God because some of this time on Shabbat is uh, invested in uh, study and prayer and song. We repair our own soul because we need time to reflect we need distance from what we do every day of the week. Uh, meaning isn't going to fall in our lap. We need to kind of open the windows. Well, Shabbat is a time to open the windows. New ideas uh, blow in, new perspectives. So uh, we repair ourselves. It's totally artificial, and yet it's sanctified by uh, thousands of years of history. And it is articulated in the richest kind of ritual. Ritual is the language of religion. The trouble with uh, contemporary America is that it has no patience for ritual. Disembodied ideas are very hard to transmit. Ritual is a vehicle for transmitting values and ideas. They're vessels. In our intellectual, sophisticated society, we don't have any vessels. We just have liquid but no containers in which to pour it. And you can't transmit disembodied ideas very easily to the next generation. Uh, I wanted to ask you about kosher dietary laws, for example. It would seem to me that it was explained to me in the 50s in a kind of pseudoscientific way that the prohibition about eating meat and dairy together had some sort of scientific basis, which no longer obtains in the era of modern sanitation, et cetera, et cetera. What, what, why would, except as a kind of arbitrary mark of faith, why would someone keep kosher today? The dietary laws are a way of uh, elevating a very basic bodily function. We have to eat. But uh, we surround eating with uh, uh, religious and spiritual significance. And that adds a dimension that isn't there uh, naturally. The dietary laws sensitize us to a lot of things. They sensitize us to the fact that we kill in order to sustain ourselves. And there is, a, there is a, an, an element of uh, regret that life has to be taken to sustain life. The ideal in the Bible is vegetarianism. When uh, Adam and Eve are first created, everybody's a vegetarian. The consumption of meat is only given to Noah after the flood as a concession. What happens in the Bible is that God lowers his expectations steadily. The creature that he created disappoints him time and again. So Judaism doesn't indulge in excessive asceticism, but it does try to raise uh, consciousness. So when we eat, we take life. Uh, there is a measure of discipline here, but... Uh, you know, discipline sometimes makes us feel very good. Uh, the discipline of playing uh, tennis once a week, uh, you feel invigorated. Right. Uh, the exercise uh, has liberated. Uh, ritual can liberate. It can liberate uh, the spirit. One gets a sense of self-control, of uh, a measure of uh, transcending oneself. Uh, so uh, there is a discipline in religion, not as an end in itself, but to deepen the uh, the inner life. So in a way you have to struggle or sacrifice to keep kosher. You have to go out of your way to do it. It's not, maybe in New York City it's pretty easy, but if you're in 
Norfolk, Virginia, or some other place. Well, you really have to work at it. And but isn't it true that, in effect, in this time and near the end of the 20th century, that the rules are to some extent arbitrary if they're historical, but they're arbitrary, and this is what you do if you want to be part of a certain Jewish community. Uh, absolutely. They're, they're arbitrary from the viewpoint of the outsider. From the viewpoint of the insider, they are a very ancient way of sanctifying the consumption of food. So sitting around a table is uh, a momentary religious service, as well as uh, the satisfying of a basic uh, bodily need. Uh, the, the power of the ritual is partly its antiquity. I have another story. Um, my first wife and I, my Gentile wife, uh, she had two children when we were married, but we had uh, another one together. And the child died after 18 months of heart disease. And we had no common ritual. She was alienated from her God. I was alienated from mine. And what did we do? We attacked each other and blamed it on each other. And if we had a common God or somebody to say this is God's will or this is something, we might still be together, although it was a kind of a shaky marriage to begin with. And there have been several times in my life when I wish I had had the entree to some sort of higher something or some wiser person to tell me that it's not my fault, that I'm not alone, that this happens, you know, and you'll get over it and, and so forth. So I, that's one of the examples of why I need some kind of faith and some kind of uh, community. That's a very powerful uh, uh, personal story. That's when we're at the brink, when uh, death strikes so uh, closely. Uh, and that's precisely when uh, we need ritual. We need ritual to express our emotions, and we need ritual because it keeps chaos at bay. And if you don't have it, you turn on each other. I think that's an incredibly, uh, that's a searing story. One of the, 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 the most meaningful rituals for me in Judaism is Shiva. Because what does it provide? It provides community. You have a sense of uh, being abandoned. For our non-Jewish listeners, that's a wake. It's the equivalent that's of a wake. seven days of mourning. It's not an easy uh, ritual to observe. It's emotionally draining, but it gives you the support of the community uh, at a moment when you are alone. The other thing that it gives you is structure. There, there are things you have to do. Uh, no matter uh, how overwhelmed you are, you have to go and uh, recite the services. You have to recite the Kaddish. Uh, there's a wonderful phrase, you know, what do you say to a person who's just lost an 18-month-old child? So Judaism says, say to that person what we've always said, and there's a formula. And I just want to uh, dwell on the formula for a moment. Hamakom yenachem etchem betoch shar'e, shar evlei tzion v'yerushalayim. Few Hebrew words. May God uh, comfort you among the mourners of uh, Israel and Zion. And uh, I found that an extremely comforting phrase for the following reason. The word used for God is hamakom. In Hebrew, God has many names. What you love, you uh, give a lot of names to. Judaism is about a relationship to God, so we have many names. And here, in this setting, we choose the name Makom, which means place. Why didn't we choose another name? Well, I think what's appropriate about the use of God's name as Makom, place, is because what we're trying to convey is that even in this moment of darkest despair, God's with you. There is no place where God is not to be found. And so we use the name Makom, and not another name. And the other point that we try to make with this formula is that there's a community out there of mourners. Uh, you are not mourning alone. Evlei Tzion v'Yerushalayim. Those who are mourning uh, for Zion and for Israel. Uh, those who are mourning for loved ones. So comfort comes from two sources. Uh, one is God, and one is a community. And both are meant to uh, suggest that you're not alone. 
this is a moment when one feels totally alone. And yet, the few words that we utter are meant to remind us uh, that there's a support system. And we had none. And frankly, I have not fully grieved for her. Her name was Rachel. I have not fully expiated the guilt I felt because I was in New York building my career and running a radio station and I left the medical management to my wife and to a country doctor and I feel very bad that I wasn't there to take her to some specialist in New York and on and on and on and on and it still has it's like hairball in me it hasn't gone away uh, and, and the ritual gives you a chance to begin to work this through and uh, the, the ritual for mourning in Judaism is a series of concentric circles. So the most intense mourning is the morning before the burial. And it is so intense that one is freed from observing all other commandments. And then you go through the funeral, and after the funeral, you have these seven days where you don't work, where you stay at home, where the community provides you with food, and the minion, the services take place in the home of the mourner. And then you have uh, 30 days uh, a month where the intensity of the mourning declines, but it's still there. Uh, males don't shave during this period. You go to services to the recite the Kaddish, the prayer for the dead. And then there is the period of 11 months. And uh, the mourning diminishes, but it's still there. And then it comes to an end after 11 months. So there is a, a, a gradation of mourning that is meant to return you to life. So the mourning is serious but not excessive, and it's modulated, and it always takes place within community. There are a lot of words to be said in Judaism. Uh, the synagogue service has a lot of words, and again, we bristle at all these words. And I'm the f first to admit to you that sometimes there are way too many words. But there is a wisdom in the recitation of words, even if we don't understand one of them. And that is just the activity of reciting the words. And so the words become vessels for our emotions. The expression of emotion isn't a function of the meaning of the word. It's a function of the recitation of the words. And that is also cathartic. Yeah. And that's what I experience when I hear the Sabbath services on the radio or on the rare occasions when I'm in a synagogue. I don't know what the words mean. I know what the basic brachas mean, but I don't know really what's going on. But I feel that connection and that uh, ancient ritual that I heard with my grandfather in uh, Temple Sinai. I think that this is a good place to stop. It's a beautiful moment. I hope we can continue this discussion and that through you I can learn more about my grandfather's faith and about what what it might hold for me. I, when you talked about the morning ritual, I was thinking, you know, how could I possibly do this? You know, give up weeks of work and a year of uh, full participation in life, but the alternative is to carry around this grief and this guilt for the rest of my life about this child. Right, which is uh, even more incapacitating. But it's, it's, it's not a withdrawal from life. Uh, for 11 months. Uh, it is a withdrawal to a certain extent from the joy of life. So one doesn't go to a concert or a movie. But uh, there are gradations of uh, mourning with a view to helping us uh, restore our sense of balance and our faith. Uh, Larry, I thank you for inviting me into your personal life. Thank you, Rabbi Shorsh. I've been talking with Dr. Ismar Shorsh, who is the Chancellor of the Jewish Theological Seminary of America, located on 122nd Street and Broadway in Manhattan. Thank you so much. You're a beautiful man. Thank you, Larry. We'd like to hear your comments or criticisms. Call our listener comment line at 212-595-2920 or write us at Bridges, P.O. Box 2000, GPO, New York, New York, 10116. Our email address is bridges at radioarc.org. Our homepage can be found at www.radioarc.org.
You've been listening to Bridges. To order a cassette of this program or to be on our mailing list, call our order line at 1-800-47-BRIDGE. Ask for program number 212. Cassettes are $15. Bridges was developed and produced for the Radio Foundation by Larry Josephson. This program was produced by Larry Josephson, edited by Curtis Fox, and recorded and mixed by Peter Zanger. Funding from public radio stations and the Radio Foundation. I'm Larry Josephson. Thank you.